the title of my discourse is Children, God's Example is Our Template. And uh, this was inspired by a uh, comment that I think Brother David Rice made during the online prophecy convention earlier this year. And uh, one of the brothers, I think it was David, he, he suggested that we could do a much better job leading our children in spiritual things. And uh, so I decided to take a look into God's example. And uh, as he set before us in the Holy uh, Bible, and I happen to agree. I think our children and our spiritual children are one of the most important responsibilities of the Gospel Age Church. Number two, I think we've done a poor job overall. There's an admission of guilt on my part, as well as an observation uh, in the Bible students movement uh, worldwide. And uh, I think we can do a much better job if we follow God's example. Um, remember, remember the parable of the sower. And I think our job as adult parents is to help cultivate the good ground of our children's heart and make it ready to receive the gospel seed. Remember, one of the qualifications of an elder is that we, uh, the elders should rule their home well. And I think it's a, uh, a great time to look at God's example and ask God to open our minds uh, to understanding and be with us. So, you know, the battleground of our children's faith uh, is in our homes and um, he, in, in their touches with the world and in the touches of our, in the, their experience within our ecclesia. So there's an interesting scripture, and uh, it's found in Deuteronomy 24, verse 6, and uh, it talks about miscellaneous laws in Deuteronomy. And the law says this, it says, No man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge, for he hath taken a man's life to pledge. So that means if I were to uh, lend money to somebody, they would not be able to take the millstone that I had in my house as a collateral for that loan. Now, I think that there's a uh, uh, int interesting lesson here. Of course, each home had the tools to convert the harvested seed into ready, prepared food, uh, flour, cornmeal, etc., for their home. And uh, the lesson is this. Everybody should have a millstone in their home, and they should use it. So this is a lesson for all of us. All of us as a, parents should have a millstone in our home. What is that? Well, it's an opportunity to provide spiritual food for our families. And this is, the, this is part of the metaphor. I think our job is to teach our children from the word of God. And uh, my experience in, in, uh, among the brethren is that we could do a much better job with that. Um, so one of the interesting uh, other scriptures, you've heard me speak about this before. It says, and ye shall teach them your children uh, this is the word of God. We can find this, find this in Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is the famous mezuzah scripture. And by the way, this is a picture of the mezuzah that I used to have on our home uh, when we uh, lived in a previous uh, home. It, it says this, it says, and ye shall teach them, these are the word scriptures, to your children, speaking of the scriptures, when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine heart, or of thine house and upon thy gates. So I have a question for you. How many of you are teaching your children out of the Bible every day? I think that's what this scripture is implying and that's what we should be doing. Here's a couple of other scriptures. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, what is the best gift we can give to our children? I think it's the gift of faith. How much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? That's found in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. And then, of course, we have uh, the epistle of John, uh, 3 John 1, 1 through 4, where he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. So I think that uh, it's important for us to give, to prepare our children's heart for the good ground. Okay, we all agree on that. But this is what we're up against. We are up against a, a, a world that floods our children with glittering lights. We're up against a world that basically provides the music, the, the drum beat, uh, a party atmosphere. Uh, life is presented to our children as unbridled instant gratification. 
And we know that that's not what God presents to us in the scriptures. And uh, at this point, uh, especially in the adolescent years, children get inspired. Have you ever been inspired? Have you ever been inspired to stay up all night uh, with the mental energy all, all of a sudden at your resource to work on a project? Brethren, that's called inspiration. And that is what's attracting our children away from the word of God, away from the lessons that we've taught them. Now, there's a, a really great um, uh, set of paintings in the uh, Museum uh, of uh, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., that Brother Dan Wojcik pointed out to me one day. And uh, these are paintings by an American artist named Thomas Cole. And he talks about the four stages of life. And um, he paints beautiful pictures of the four stages of life. And so I think these are emblematic. It's another way to look at the challenges that our children face in our world today. And um, this is from the child's perspective. These paintings are from the child's perspective. So this is the first state or the first stage of life. The child is watched over and protected in a lush environment with smooth waters. We all want to do that. We all protect our children at home. We all want to teach them the word of God. We all want to develop in them faith. We all want to provide that good ground so that during the time when God calls them, if that was the will of God, that it would provide the good ground for the gospel seed to take root. We watch over our children, and with divine help, we try to provide for their every need. So we have this little child on this in this image on a gilded boat with beautiful, uh, all the provisions he might need. And he comes out of a place that, you know, uh, out of a cave. And uh, let's see what the next stage of life brings us. Um, the next stage of life brings us youth. And uh, this is the point of inspiration. This is the point where the child becomes an adolescent. And uh, this is the point where a child is really yearning for something with their mental energy. And um, the child becomes an adolescent. They depart from the protection of those wiser and stronger than, they, than them. And they begin their own grand adventure. You can see the angel is on the shore now, not on the boat. The child doesn't recognize that divine power. They're being attracted to the castle and the clouds because they see their parents more of uh, being help, holding them in custody rather than mentoring them and facilitating their growth. And this is the point where our children are attracted to mammon. And what is mammon? Well, it's what we can conceive with our minds and do with our hands. And of course, this was an important uh, transition for the apostle Peter uh, the Apostle Peter, Jesus came up and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He said, drop your nets, Peter. Drop your nets and follow me. And um, it was important because now Jesus was going to be retooled, so to speak. He was going to, Jesus was going to help G Peter become a fisher of men. So all of the tools that he was going to use for his secular life, he was going to now use for his spiritual work. And that's a big idea. And uh, I think that's what's lost here. Uh, children are attracted to mammon and um, uh, because they want to be have gainful employment. They want to initialize families. And uh, let's see how we can connect these two together. Um, but sadly, many of us as parents are not good facilitators. Why? Why are we not good facilitators? Well, because we don't follow God's example. And uh, so this castle in the sky, we know that that's just an illusion. Um, and if you take a look at this river and you follow it, uh, take a look at how it kind of bends away from the castle in the sky, and it goes over to a, a, a kind of a desolate landscape over there on the right side of the picture. The angel knows that. We know that. Our children don't know that. They're attracted to mammon. They're attracted to what they can conceive with their mind and what they can do with their hands. So, uh, and then, of course, at later in life, we see the, the, uh, the manhood, the adulthood. We see the boat finally uh, reaching the place that uh, we saw in the right side of the picture earlier and uh, going through the rapids of life, the difficulties, the landscape is foreboding, the clouds, but in the angel, angelic presence uh, is far away. And now the, as an adult, this man is, is uh, trying to uh, ask God to come near. And then finally, uh, at the end of their life, God has a way of getting our attention in the troubles of life. And uh, if we build, if our children build that life on, a, on sand, then they're going to go through the, the storms of life that are going to get their attention to the divine presence. 
But in this case, at the, uh, at, at, at the old age, the gilded ship has lost its intricate beauty and luster. You can see the rapids really tore that ship up and this is what happens. It's not, this ship has not supported the traveler through the storms of life. And now the man is old with many lost opportunities for durable spiritual growth. And this is the problem, is that when people come back to the Lord later on, they have not as many durable opportunities for durable spiritual growth and their of, of communion with God and resting in the peace of Christ. So let's take a look to see what we can uh, uh, insights we have about this. Now, this is an example of uh, brother Takeki Ishikawa. Some of you know that every um, uh, week for the last 15 years, we've done uh, Bible studies with the brethren in Japan and uh, brother David Namiski is on the phone or on the zoom right now. Uh, he might remember this mountain. It's Tsukuba uh, Mountain in Japan. And uh, Brother Takeki Ishikawa, as a young man, about 15 years old during World War II, um, he was gathering rice in this field. And he decided to lie down one day and look up at the, stop, at the sky and, and uh, consider God and contemplate God. And at that moment, a P-51 Mustang came overhead and started shooting at him. And uh, he was obviously frightened out of his skull. And uh, what it did though, it gave him a sobering moment. So it was that little experience with fear that kept him from being head over heels in the, a life of mammon. And um, so this was a, an awful experience that he had at the end of World War II. Immediately a prayer went up to God asking for salvation. The plane came back, it was so low that he could see the people in the cockpit. It was shooting at him again. They, they, all of the bullets missed their target. And what did it do? it gave Brother Takeki a very strong and terrible experience, and it pushed him away from the allurements of the world, and it pushed him toward Christ. Now, some of us have these experiences. Some of the, us have these experiences uh, at, young, at, at a uh, young life, and some of us don't have those experiences uh, until later in life. Well, the model that we're going to present is this that we believe that this is what I, this is what i found in the scriptures there's a there's a circular system that god uses to um, work with us and develop us as his spiritual children today we can see that system uh, used throughout the scriptures through several different experiences that we're going to bring up and uh, i believe that this example of god uh, should be our template as we uh, try to develop our physical children and our spiritual children. And we believe that considering God's example, it's not gonna solve all of our problems, but it will give us a competitive advantage. And as we try to raise both our children and our spiritual children. So let's take a look. Um, the first is inspire. Well, let's go back to this. Uh, the first uh, thing that God uses in his, um, in his toolbox is inspiration. And, I, and the big lesson in this service today is that we, most of the time, we don't pay attention to inspiration. We try to go right to direction as we direct our children and spiritual children. We want them to do this. We want them to do that. We want them to go here. We want them to go there. And we tell them what to do. We tell them what they should believe, but we don't start with inspiration. But this is what God starts with. He starts with inspiration and then he gives us direction and then he provides information. So this is the um, the backbone of, of my thoughts today. Um, inspiration. Uh, we can, we remember the scripture in Romans chapter one, uh, verse 20. It says, for the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being perceived through the things that are made, even his everlasting power and divine nature, that they may be without excuse. What does that mean? Well, it means that as we look at the nature that God has provided us, a beautiful home, a beautiful opportunity to grow up in him and to have, to be made in his likeness, uh, to be able to have a healthy body and to uh, be able to consider God. Um, we should make sure that that is our inspiration, that we don't start telling us ourselves story, other stories like the world of mankind has been doing over the centuries. They've been telling all kinds of mythological stories about the origin of life, but guess what? They're without excuse because the word of God is there for us. And that's what we should be uh, doing for our children. We should be inspiring them first. Um, here's a situation where Jesus uh, used inspiration twice. 
several times, obviously, but these are the only two that I called out. The first one is when he opened the eyes of the blind man. That blind man needed to see. And uh, the Jesus was going to begin with inspiration. And the, uh, the second one was the, where Jesus was trying to open up the ears of understanding of the teachers in the synagogue when he was probably in his teenage years. So we have two opportunities here where Jesus is showing us that inspiration is really opening up the eyes of the blind. Now, what are we opening up the eyes of the blind to? Are we going to go headstrong into God's word and tell them what they need to believe? Or are we going to start asking questions? Are we going to give them the opportunity to get skin in the game, as it were? So God begins with inspiration. Jesus began with inspiration. And then here's an example of how Jesus then took step number two with the uh, uh, future apostles that were in the fishing boat. Now, this was after their first meeting with Jesus and uh, where he was inspiring them. Remember, Andrew brought Peter to Jesus said, hey, look, come follow me. We've come, come, come see, we've found the Messiah. So Peter says, are you crazy? And uh, of course, Peter and Andrew went to go see Jesus. And then sometime after that, Jesus said, guys, follow me, drop your nets and I will make you fishers of men. And then of course, information. And uh, if we try to give our children and spiritual children the information before we go to the first two steps of uh, inspiration and uh, direction, then um, we're kind of cutting short the example that God gave us. This is a, a scripture from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And I love this picture because it shows um, the apostle Paul and Timothy walking and uh, the apostle Paul leaning on the shoulder of Timothy and basically pulling him along. Uh, it says, the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So this is the information. Uh, but before Paul got Timothy to this point, what did he do? He inspired him. And he gave him the direction. He says, listen, I know your grandma. I know your mother. I know their faith, Lois and Eunice. And, and I know that I laid my hands on you and gave you that spiritual gift of teaching. Now get up and start using it. And uh, so those were the opportunity to inspire Timothy by reminding him of his heritage. They were the opportunity to direct uh, uh, Timothy in his role. And now the Apostle Paul was informing him, telling him where to go uh, to, find, to make himself wise into salvation. So we think that these three steps are really important for us to follow. Why? Well, because we have spiritual investments. And our children and our spiritual children are the most important horizon for us at this stage, I think, at the end of the gospel age. And so often we forget the first stage of inspiration. Uh, so often we don't use them in the development of our children and our spiritual children. Inspiration, direction, and information. Okay, so let's see how this plays out in the life of Cornelius. Uh, I really like this uh, story. It's inspiring. Um, Cornelius, of course, was a Roman centurion, and um, we find in Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, um, the inspiration aspect. So take a look. I'm going to read these two scriptures and think about how uh, Cornelius is inspired. Acts chapter 10, verses 2 through 3, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house. Do you see that? He had already believed in God. So there were some experiences in his life that already gave him a heart that was ready to receive the gospel, which gave him much alms to the people and prayed to God all way. So uh, Cornelius was already acting on his faith and being generous and, uh, to other people. Verse three, he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. Okay, there's your inspiration. You've got a good man with the good ground in his heart. And now God was going to, through Jesus, was going to inspire Cornelius. So what happens next? Well, it, the direction happens next. And that's in Acts chapter 10, verse 4. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thine alms are come up 
for a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And um, so now we have direction, basically telling uh, Cornelius to send, to send men to Joppa and get a guy named Peter. And then uh, we have information, and it's in verses 30 through 34 through 43. And this is where Peter came to deliver the gospel to Cornelius, and it's just beautiful. Let's consider these words. But let's remember that this, these words did not happen until after Cornelius was inspired and after Cornelius was directed what to do. Now think of the, these words and think of how little value they would be without the first two steps of inspiration and direction. Acts chapter 10, verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Wow, do you see the inspiration from Peter too? So we have two people going through the example from God, inspiration, direction, information. We have not only Cornelius, but we have Peter going through the same experience, and it's kind of really cool. It's kind of a, a dovetailing experience. Uh, and then Peter continues, and he says, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. We're not going to read the entire passage, but this is where Peter delivers the gospel message to Cornelius. Now, um, how was Peter inspired in this whole experience? And it's just wonderful to see the econ economy of God as he develops his children. Well, Peter was inspired. How? Do you remember? He was inspired by that heavenly vision. Just think of if Jesus said, go to Cornelius's house, Peter, without giving him that vision, that heavenly vision on the housetop. Just think of how Peter would have a mental block in going to Cornelius's house as a Gentile and not understanding until he was inspired by this vision that he had on the rooftop. Basically, it was a wonderful storytelling session that Jesus gave Peter, and uh, he was inspired with the vision. And then where do we get, how is Peter directed? He is, uh, it says, go, to, go, to, go with them. Go with these men that come to your door. When they come to your door, go with them. That's the direction. And then the information. I'm, there's no respecter of persons. Uh, the new truth that was unfolding at the end of the 70 weeks prophecy. And we can find that in, in uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 34. So we see that this beautiful template, this beautiful example that God gave us through the experiences throughout the scriptures. And we're just going to hit on a few of them. Um, but some of you might remember uh, the discourse that I gave in um, um, at the general convention three years ago. Uh, how to inspire like Jesus, uh, you might say, okay, Brother Todd, uh, it's okay. I, li I like the idea of inspiration as a first step. How do you do it? Well, there was a discourse that I gave at um, the General Convention three years ago, and uh, I would point you to it. Uh, the title is How to Inspire Like Jesus, and uh, Jesus basically uh, used seven different keys of inspiration. He used seven different ways that he inspired people. And you can do this with your children. Uh, the one with Cornelius is the seventh step, uh, storytelling, uh, with a vision, in a vision, or a, 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 an angel appearing to Cornelius. So you can inspire people sometimes by just telling a story. Uh, but we begin with question. Uh, you can show them love. Uh, you can give them hope. You can help them see their own integrity. Uh, you can give them uh, an insight into the power, the potential for power and to change their life. Uh, and you can give them purpose. This is a beautiful uh, experience that Jesus had when he uh, taught us the seven steps of inspiration throughout his life. So uh, I'd like to point you to that service uh, and then take a look at this screen. Because these three uh this, this template that God gives us of inspiration, of direction, and information, these can be mapped to the spiritual senses. And what I've found in the scriptures is that in order to inspire people, you need to open up their spiritual eyesight, and you need to open up their spiritual ears of understanding. And if we recall, that's exactly what Jesus was doing when he opened up the eyes of the blind and when he went to the synagogue to preach the gospel and to open up the scriptures uh, to the uh, uh, teachers at the synagogue, 
these are two areas that we can use to inspire. And uh, th these are the two spiritual senses that I would suggest we apply. Um, Matthew th chapter 13, verse 14, um, Jesus says, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing ye shall hear and not understand. In other words, Jesus, uh, in, in his pre-human existence as the Logos, God asked him to go to the earth and preach because, but he says the people are going to hear and not understand and they're going to see and they're not going to perceive. He continues by saying, by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. So these are mapping the two first spiritual senses that we see connected with the first step of inspiration. The second direction, uh, we might quote, John chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Wow, we've heard that scripture used a few times uh, in, in actually the popular news. Um, not sure if it was applied appropriately, but uh, in our own lives, as we find the truth, as we find the power of God's word, as we see the invitation of the high calling, really provides a certain freedom like we get to get out of prison and it's important for us to be able to present this concept to our children and spiritual children as we try to do the evangelistic work of the of the harvest work but if we do it without inspiration first then we're going to have a lot less success and then of course um the two spiritual senses that I think are associated with direction, uh, basically uh, discernment, which is smelling, and desire, which is, is, is touching. And uh, discernment, you know, we all smell our food before we eat it. So this is a good example of, of uh, how discernment is so important as we contemplate the proper direction uh, in our life. And, and as we contemplate the proper way to provide direction to our spiritual children in our, in our, in our, uh, natural children. And then of course we want to inculcate in them a sense of desire. And then finally, uh, the, the fifth spiritual sense of taste is experience. And that's connected with, um, the information step. And, uh, we find this in John chapter 16, verse 13. It says, how we be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. My friends, if we try to get to the step of information without going through the step of ins uh, in inspiration first and then direction, we're going to come up short in our efforts to raise our children and our spiritual children. Why? Because they are being assaulted continually with their physical senses and their spiritual senses in this world that we're living, this hyper-focused media world, the addictive apps that are being created to captivate their attention. Uh, even some of you are probably right now addicted to um, some of these uh, apps that you play on your mobile phone or your iPad, Candy Crush Saga. I've seen a lot of brethren paste that on, post that on Facebook. They're ridiculous, but that's the that's the temptation that our children are receiving to pull them away from the word of God. And it's our objective to use God's example to raise our children and to raise our spiritual children. How? By first inspiring them, next by directing them, and third by informing them. And if we try to inform them or direct them before we inspire them, we're not going to be having much success. Let's take a look at um, Adam in the Garden of Eden. So a couple of examples I'd like to share. God to Adam, and, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to keep it or to dress it and to keep it. Well, wow, that's a beautiful opportunity. God inspired Adam. Wow, he, he, he inspired Adam with a beautiful earth. Uh, he gave him a beautiful wife, and he directed Adam how? He directed Adam to possess the earth and to dress it. And, uh, and then, of course, later came the information. Don't eat that fruit. Don't, Adam, don't eat that fruit. If you eat it, you're going to die. But guess what? 
Satan came along and he captivated the spiritual senses of Eve and Adam. And um, of course, the, the rest is history. And we're, we're having our own experience with that curse right now. But God gave Adam purpose. He gave him the earth to possess it, to dress it. And he gave him a purpose. And that was the opportunity for inspiration. That was the way God inspired Adam. Okay, let's take a look at uh, um, God and the Logos. We referred to the scripture earlier in Isaiah uh, when Jesus quoted Isaiah chapter 6. So the next example we'd like to share is how God inspired the Logos. And um, God used the question. He said, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Wow, God asked the Logos a question. That is what inspired Jesus. And he says, then said I, here am I, send me. That was the Logos, I'm sorry. So do you see God inspired the Logos by asking a question? He directed the Logos to go, and then he gave him all the information. He says, um, basically, he told the Logos what to do. He said, and tell his people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of the people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Do you see that all that information that Jehovah gave the Logos? It came after inspiration and direction. It came after God, Jehovah used purpose to inspire Jesus to go do the work on earth. So that's the example that we should be following. Another example is um, God to the church. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. That's the beautiful uh, language that Brother Tim Krupa was talking about. Um, this is happening after we're inspired. This is happening to the disciples after they were inspired. And um, after they were directed to Jesus. And now the information that God would send a comforter to inform us, to teach us, to reassure us. Wow, what a blessing. Now, the, the disciples were already inspired. They were already directed in Acts chapter 2 when they were about to receive the Holy Spirit. But, you know, there was a lot of probably doubts in their mind. There was a lot of difficult hurdles that they had to overcome, the disappointments of the last 50 days, the crucifixion, the uh, being alone, being almost abandoned. It was a primal experience, and now they are going to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. It was the first tangible proof that they were under God and Jesus's care. When we know that this uh, word is parakletos, it means an intercessor and a consoler, an advocate, a comforter. So the Holy Spirit was a tool that God used through Jesus to coming alongside of the disciples, to coming alongside of us and directing us and teaching us. And through that, we would be informed of the truth. Do you see the template, the example of God that's working on our behalf? I, do, I dearly love these, uh, this picture. It, um, it kind of is the picture that I fall back on. It's the visual that I see when I think of Jesus's relationship with the gospel age church. Wow, don't you just love that picture? I'm going to print that picture out before I leave work and I'm going to hang it on my wall. That we can just kind of flop into the arms of Jesus and appreciate his care. Why are we able to do that? Well, we first we're inspired and then we're directed and then we're given information. And uh, Jesus is the great consoler through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, Jesus provides that sympathetic, that all-knowing, uh, yet it's a perfect standard that, that we can take both comfort in and look up to as our older brother. Now, Jesus directed them to go to the mountain. Some doubted, but Jesus began with information, uh, with inspiration, and then he continues with direction, and then he provides them information in the scripture that we're going to read. In Matthew chapter 28, this is the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 16. Uh, then the, the 11 disciples went away into Galilee. This was before the descent of the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, it says, and the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Wow. They saw Jesus resurrected. They worshiped him. But then listen to what else it says. It says, some doubted. Why? Wow. Our children have that same difficulty when they leave our home and go out into the wide, wide world, because this is the point where they doubt and they have to find their own way. And if we haven't inspired them, if we haven't directed them, if we haven't given them the information that they need in that order, then we're going to lose them. And let's see what Jesus did here. Verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power is given un unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Do you see the direction? First of all, Jesus inspired them again by saying, I've got all power in heaven and earth. Then he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. There's purpose. And then teach them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. There's information. That's what we bank on at, in the Gospel Age Church as we fall back into the loving arms of Jesus. Jesus is always with us. And that's the information that Jesus was delivering at this point. Let's take a look at the next uh, example. This is the, the time when the people came to hear Jesus um, on the Beatitudes the, and the Sermon on the Mount. We can find this in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And uh, the people came out to hear Jesus. Why did they come out to hear Jesus? Well, they came out to hear Jesus because he inspired them. Jesus inspired them. And uh, in the Beatitudes and in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus told the people things that they knew to be true about themselves. They knew these things to be true about themselves, but they never dared think about. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who thirst after righteousness. These are things that they knew to be true. So Jesus was telling them things that were resonating in their heart. And this was the first preamble to the Sermon on the Mount. And I think this is a good lesson. He gave them purpose. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Wow. Previous to that point, they were treated very poorly by the religious leadership of the Jewish arrangement. But now they were given purpose. They were giving hope. They were giving inspiration. He gave them the tools to be the salt and light with the 27 steps of good Christian living found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So I think in this uh, very experience, we see um, how Jesus used God's example, which should be our template. First, he inspired them with the Beatitudes. And then he directed them, said, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. And then he gave them the information that they needed. Now, the reason why I put a picture of the Pharisees on here is because um, Jesus's words were contrasted. That was the tension that was in the people's hearts. There was a tension going on in the people's hearts. They weren't satisfied with the faith that the Pharisees were delivering with them, to them. And uh, why? Why were they not satisfied with the Pharisees' truth? Because the Pharisees skipped the step of inspiration. The Pharisees' message could never inspire the people into faith. So let this lesson be true for us. If we don't inspire our children, if we don't ins first inspire our children and our spiritual children, then we will be like the Pharisee. What we say might be correct, but it will not do the job our children need in order to grow to maturity of faith or to weather the storms of life. I remember when I was 33 years old, uh, Brother Owen Kendig Sr. invited me to his home and uh, basically opened up the Bible and we went through the whole Sermon on the Mount. And he went, he, it was just a beautiful experience for me because it inspired me. So do you see God's example through all of this? Um, First inspiration, then direction, then information. Um, there are biblical formulas for this that you can use if you know these three steps. You can put these biblical formulas together and create 
opportunities to guide your physical children and your spiritual children if you use the example that God gave you. Um, on the right here, there's a, um, a image of the back of my handout from the, from the uh, um, convention and the general convention three years ago. And Brother Brett, if you're listening, if you could post those two handouts that I uh, gave you so that they can, the brethren can download them, I would cer cer certainly appreciate it. So we have to begin with inspiration. You know, inspiration is critical. This, this is what we're, we're beginning with, with our children. This is how we begin. As a baby, we giggle with happiness and joy. And then what happens? When we grow up, we start to hide our true selves. It happens when we go to school. When we go to school uh, and spend a lot of time uh, with other people, we learn how to become uncomfortable. We learn how to be uncomfortable with ourselves when we compare ourselves with others. This is the difficulty of our children right now. They're trying to compare themselves with this perfect standard that the media puts out there. They're trying to compare themselves with all of the adolescent stuff that their fellow classmates are going through. And the, our children forget about what makes them unique. We lose the happiness and joy. Our children are just like us. They lose the happiness and joy because they began to compare themselves with others. And we all fall short in our own mind when we compare ourselves with others. What's the antidote? We need inspiration. We need to provide inspiration for those children. We need to hold a mirror up so that they can see themselves reflected in that mirror so that they can easily see that they have value, that their unique value is unique and powerful. We need to give them a big dose of sacred awe in order to find that happiness and joy that was covered over. Inspiration is the opportunity to open up their heart to God. It's the opportunity to uncover their joy and to bring that sacred awe before God back. It's that opportunity to have that prayer that Takeki was, that he answered when he was lying on his back in that rice field. And in this picture, I love it because Jesus was helping the children feel comfortable in their own skin. He was inspiring them. Look at that little boy. He brought his horse to it. Uh, Jesus is, has a, a prop there, a dove, and uh, he's teaching these children that they are beautiful just the way they are. So let's do that same thing. Let's co-opt the example that God gave us, and let's show our children how beautiful they are. Let's inspire them to show their value so that they are not taking a right turn off into the sunset of mammon. Let's start with inspiration. Let's not be like the Pharisees. Let's start with inspiration, then give them direction, and then give them the information. We're going to skip this step, um, but well, your job and my job is to open the spiritual eyes and the spiritual ears of those in our charge. That's our job, just like what Jesus gave an example. Now, I have another interesting uh, story that happened uh, earlier this year. Uh, I was on a walk around our neighborhood, and I met this family of four, um, and I stopped to say hello. And uh, they were Chinese, and um, I uh, basically said a greeting to them and then kept walking. Well, guess what? 15 minutes later, I ran into them again and uh, found out that they were from Hong Kong, and it was their very, their second day in the United States of America. And um, the fact that I ran into them again, I took it as a message from God and uh, that I needed to speak to these people. So God was inspiring me here. And God was giving me the opportunity to inspire these folks from Hong Kong. So they showed me where they lived. And uh, two weeks later, I found uh, the woman and her two daughters outside and their, their lawn was 24 inches tall. The grass was 24 inches high. And um, I said, hey, you know what? I, I think I, I need to mow your lawn for you. A kind of reason that they probably didn't have a lawnmower. And um, the mother, Monica, she said, she looked at me and she said, um, is this not appropriate for America? <laughs> and I said, no. So anyway, um, I mowed their lawn. Sister Marilyn came over and uh, served their needs, helped them through lots of immigration problems, medical insurance problems, school applications, a host of other things. Marilyn spent several days helping them. And guess what? They're, they are Christians, and they um, now have the first volume in Chinese. 
They have God's Green Plan of the Ages in Chinese. They attended one of my discourses uh, on Zoom. And um, guess what? We took care of their physical needs first. And that was the opportunity that God gave. He opened the door and said, Todd, you're going to inspire these people's needs. Now, the interesting thing is that they had family in, our, in, in, in not, not more than 10 miles away. But the, for some reason, the family was not available. So God sent me to these people and Sister Marilyn helped me out. Now, I've had an experience like that in my own life. Um, when I was 17 years old, I went over to Egypt with the brother August Tornquist for nine weeks. And um, brother Tornquist was a spiritual father to me. Something happened to me in Egypt. And that something was my spiritual mind was initialized. And it, I was inspired. Uh, God inspired me. My parents got my heart ready to receive that inspiration from God. And God delivered inspiration through August Tornquist. August Tornquist was a walking encyclopedia of knowledge. I walked around, so he watched how many times he witnessed of the power of the scriptures and how it changed his life. He didn't tell me what I had to believe. He explained the power of the word of God as it changed his life. So I was inspired in Egypt. August Tornquist directed me. And then the information that I received was in a language that I could understand. As if you haven't noticed, I'm kind of an artist in the way I think, in the way I connect scriptures together. I don't think like some of the other brethren. And the metaphor system in the Great Pyramid of the plan of God was really a great experience for me. It was in a language that I could understand uh, in angle, line, and measure. It was because I was a philosopher. So as I reflect back on that experience, I see that August Tornquist was just the right person to inspire me. And God's grace helped me translate that inspiration into my secular work. And um, I've had a lot of uh, good experiences with that uh, over the past several weeks that we can share in another uh, situation. So what to do? Well, um, Brother Micah Hess and I are developing mentoring and coach, uh, coaching program for Bible student young people who need a little of encouragement. We're developing tools along the lines of this process and uh, we're, we're developing uh, biblical tools for inspiration and wayfinding. Um, this is a picture that I actually took uh, in Egypt. It was a black and white picture that I had a retoucher color, the sky blue, the Great Pyramid gold, and the canal. Basically, it's a straight journey. It's not going to take a crooked, crooked bend toward, towards a desolate landscape. It's a, this, this is a great metaphor of the journey of life that we should be providing for our children. But first, it comes through inspiration, and then direction, and then information. And if you get a chance, listen to Brother Micah's uh, podcast. He has about eight or nine episodes up so far. Here's another experience I'd like to share with the brethren. Uh, Brother Benjamin and Stein and I were over in um, uh, uh, Taiwan uh, in 2012. And um, it was a beautiful experience for me to see uh, as we tried to do the work of the harvest and spreading the gospel with the first volume written in Chinese. This was Brother... Paul Malley's illustrated first volume. You can see Brother Benjamin passing one out on the street. And um, the police uh, were uh, watching us rather interestingly. Just think of the tension that was in Brent Benjamin's mind at the time. And this was shortly after Benjamin was consecrated. And as I reflect back on this experience, this trip was a huge dose of inspiration. It was uncovering the sacred awe of God for Brother Benjamin Stein. And uh, uh, I'm going to play a 20 second video clip of this man. He's one of the people that Brother Benjamin gave a first volume to. And he basically went back to his office, read the thing over lunch, and then came back and he delivered us this message. So let me see if this will play. Okay, go ahead. I was reading through this book during lunch today. And uh, this is a very good book. So thanks very much to the people who put it together. I think it will be helpful to learn from Christ and the Bible and uh, what it's all about. Thank you. Okay, so that's a, a great story about how God brought Benjamin Stein over to uh, Taiwan. And um, 
uh, here's another e experience that we had. Brother Benjamin and I gave out uh, 2,400 first volumes at this uh, Bible, uh, Christian and Jewish uh, Bible fair, book fair. And this gentleman that has this book in his hand, he owned nine different Christian bookstores. So we gave him four complete boxes of books that he could offer at the bookstore. And it just so happened that he was uh, a, a political figure. He actually uh, lost in the previous uh, presidential election of Taiwan. So he was seen as a very exalted figure. Uh, what's the lesson here? God inspired this man with the images in the first volume of Brother Paul Malley's illustrated first volume. And that's what inspired this man to open up and to basically open up and explain to us the tabernacle experience. He loved it because he thought it was relevant for his bookstores. He was going to sell it uh, in his bookstores. And um, uh, guess what? Benjamin Stein was taking this picture. So here, God gave Benjamin this tangible, powerful experience with the power and direction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, brother, um, we're going to go for a few more minutes, hopefully, Bob. Um, and then we'll, we'll end, but, uh, brother, um, uh, Tim Krupa brought in Nicodemus and, uh, Nicodemus was a, a great, uh, he was inspired by Jesus miracles. He was a watcher. He was a watcher. He was inspired by Jesus miracles. Um, and we can read this in John chapter three, verse two. Uh, basically he says, uh, rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So that was the first step. That was the step of inspiration. And that's the first interaction that Nicodemus had with Jesus. And then the direction came in verse th three, where Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then the information came in verses five through seven. And then Jesus talked about being born of spirit. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of the spirit. And he goes through um, uh, this, this beautiful description, this metaphor that, that Nicodemus could understand. He said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And, and then he peels off the, the description of a metaphor to explain the Holy Spirit. We have the experience of the Philippian jailer that we won't go into detail with. Uh, we have... Um, the experience of Solomon, how God inspired Solomon in a dream first, and then uh, gave Solomon purpose in his life, gave him a job to do, uh, and that, that's just a beautiful story. Uh, and uh, we have the experience of Peter healing the lame man uh, in Acts chapter 3 with John, and uh, the inspiration was that the lame man was healed. You know, Peter didn't try to convert this man. He didn't try to convert the, the crowds. He used the spiritual, the miraculous spiritual gift of healing to inspire this man. And then um, in verse 11 of this uh, Acts chapter 3, all the people saw it. They saw the healing, so they got inspired. And they came over to Peter. They were naturally directed to Peter for more. They were greatly wondering on the, on the, uh, in the, in the porch area. And they were compelled to go to Peter because God informed them through the mouth of Peter the truth of the gospel at that point. But before they were ready to receive that truth of the gospel, Peter inspired them by healing the lame man. And then they were compelled. They were constrained. They were directed to go to Peter for more information. And then Peter delivered a most beautiful sermon of the gospel. Um, some of you might have heard the general convention replay of uh, Brother Tom Gilbert and I had a uh, uh, fireside chat in which I talked about some of the experiences uh, that we had when my son was uh, assaulted. This experience and our desire to apply godly principles to this uh, experience in our life um, provided inspiration to my family and to my children that they are still experiencing today. So what to do? In conclusion, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to advance the slides. What to do? Friends, our home and our ecclesia are two areas that we have the most influence over. That there are possible faith killers in our home as we try to raise our children. You know, they have enough enemies on the outside of our home 
they have enough enemies on the outside of the ecclesia arrangement uh, that, that we need to be very in tune to the example that God gave us and use it as a template to raise our children and our spiritual children. And um, the importance of great leadership in the home and in the ecclesia, these are areas that we do have responsibility for. We remember uh, what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. He says, feed the flock of God. And we should use a borrow liberally from God's example and add to it a lot of prayer as we develop ways to inspire our children and to open their mind. We believe that the church during the gospel age is, is the good ground for us to work in developing our children. And if we're living during times where we have the opportunity to be sober, to be focused, and to be motivated. What higher calling is there than the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? It should be our highest motivation. And then, of course, the world of mankind in Isaiah chapter 25, 28, uh, verses 8 through 9. We'll conclude with this verse. This is how the world, this is how God's example will be used to teach the world of mankind through his example, inspiration, direction, information. Isaiah 25, verse 8, he will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all tears from their faces. Do you see inspiration? And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken it, and it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. This is the response from the people. They will all be inspired. We have waited for him. We have waited to be inspired by him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Well, friends, I wish you God's blessing as you turn to the scriptures to look for examples of leadership in your children's life and your spiritual children's life. And I wish you God's richest blessing. Amen.